so sorry. I'm going to confuse that. Uh, we ask uh, Mr. Foster now to uh, spend 15 minutes in a rebuttal, giving a rebuttal of uh, Mr. Stewart's position. You can see why poor Mr. Paisley has such problems when he goes over to London to try and settle the Ulster. Ulster difficulty, can't you? <laughs> but I can understand our brother's dilemma here tonight, and we really appreciate his help. Now, here's what, here is what the Geneva Bible notes say in Colossians 3 and 16. I remember this. Of all publications that come to us from the Reformation times, it is really the voice of the Reformation. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. By psalms, he means all godly songs which are written upon various occasions. And by hymns, all such as contain the praise of God, and by spiritual songs, other more special and artful songs which were also in praise of God, but they were made fuller of music. All godly songs, not just exclusive. Psalms were to be sung exclusively, sung, but all godly songs that were written, written on various occasions, like the Song of Solomon. And like the other parts of the scripture, which come under the title Psalms. Because the Jewish Bible, when it speaks of the Psalms, you know, does not speak just of the 150 Psalms. It speaks of quite a, 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 a number of other books as well, <coughs> such as Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, and Job. Uh, and uh, I believe that the Geneva notes are indicating uh, that such are acceptable for Christians uh, to sing. I would ask you then, would John Knox have allowed his name to be associated with such comments if he were an advocate of exclusive sanity? I think not. He was in his prime in 1564 and 1565 and in the midst of the very battle for the truth in Scotland. And it was then that the Church of Scotland adopted the Book of Geneva as its solver. It contained 32 doxologies, non samaday verses, one of which could be sung at the conclusion of any psalm that the congregation engaged in. Were John Knox an exclusive singer of psalms, he would not have such compositions of men added to the Psalter. I can say that I am in agreement with the great French reformer, John Calvin, and in agreement with the great Scots reformer, John Knox. I am not one who differs from their clear position on this matter of what a Christian should sing when worshipping God. Now, I don't know whether I will have time to cover all of the ground, but let me come to the Westminster Divines. The Westminster Confession of Faith uh, urges us to sing psalms. There's just one word missing there as far as the exclusive psalmody is concerned, and it's the word only. If they had said, sing only psalms, then we would know exactly that they were in that camp, but they, they urged us to sing psalms. Now, I am not an exclusive uh, user of psalms, but I can urge people to sing the psalms. And I believe that's what the Westminster Divines were saying. They were a great collection of godly men. Most likely the greatest assembly of men that ever was gathered together in one place since the days of the apostles. Thomas Manton stood head and shoulders above these giants. He was chosen to represent the assembly of divines who authored the Westminster Confession of Faith when he was asked to write the epistle to the reader that's placed at the very beginning of this historic document. I believe that we can consider him to be the, the very embodiment of the views held 
possible by at least the majority of the divines who co-produced the Westminster Confession of Faith. What was John Manton's view on this matter? It's found in his comments on the verse, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. James 5.13, and his comment is very clear. Others question whether we may sing scriptural psalms, the psalms of David which to me seemeth to look like the cavil of a profane spirit. But to clear this also, I confess we do not forbid other songs. Manton said he did not forbid the singing of other songs of praise outside of the uh, 150 Psalms of David. If these songs are grave and pious, after good advice, they may be received into the church. Tertullian, in his apology, showed that in the primitive times they used this liberty either to sing scriptural psalms or such as were of a private composure. Two things are clear from this statement. In advancing his case for the singing of psalms, Thomas Manton did not forbid the singing of scriptural songs other than psalms. He considered, secondly, that the singing of psalms of private composure to have been the practice of the early church and refers to Tertullian as his source for believing that. I am entitled to ask the question that if Thomas Manton was or were here expressing something quite contradictory to the regulative principle and to the mind of the assembly of divines on the important matter of the public worship of God and was violating the second commandment as we have heard this evening those who uh, violate the regulative principle are guilty of would he have been permitted to represent the divines by writing the epistle to the reader at the front of their great work the Westminster Confession of Faith. I'm very confident that the answer would be a strong no. He wouldn't have got writing that epistle. He would have been so out of step with them if they were exclusive sound of it. Advocates. Thomas Banton's view on the subject, I believe, was representative of the thinking of the Westminster Divines and we conclude that the Westminster Divines were no advocates of exclusive salary. Testimonies could be presented to you from the writings of such men as the great Scottish leaders, David Dixon and Ralph er Erskine. These men produced hymns, hymns which were sung by the Scottish people in their homes. Now, if they were violating the regulative principle and violating their ordination oath and their allegiance to the Westminster Confession of Faith, they would not have retained their high standing amongst the people of Scotland and the Scottish Church in particular. That great advocate of exclusive sanity, Dr. John Kennedy of Dingwall, when speaking in the debate on this issue in the General Assembly of the Free Church of Scotland in 1870, Two said, and I quote, some desire them, that is hymns, because of an experience of enjoyment in using them in private or in social Christian conference to express their feeling of sorrow, hope, or gladness. Let these continue so to use them. I will yield to none in my desire to have them as a vehicle of any strong spiritual feeling that stirs my heart. But to use them in the worship of God in the sanctuary is quite another thing. So, Dr. Kennedy, and he's the apostle in the eyes of many of exclusive sanity. He said, I don't object to people singing hymns in their homes. Just don't sing them in church. Just don't sing them in church. Well, let me tell you this. Dr. Kennedy is unbiblical and he's unpresbyterian when he takes that stand. 